I'm Baratunde Thurston, your host and chief question asker for Unfinished Live. Beaming into your living room, your bathroom, your veranda, wherever you're at, uh, that's where we are. Today, I'm in LA coming to you for the fourth and final episode of 2020 Unfinished Live. And since this episode focuses on questions, culture, and change, I want to get right to it with a question for you. Are you ready? What is a question? that changed your life? That's the question. When I think about this for myself, I think about a question that I heard in the year 2011. It was September. I was visiting New York City and an executive at Comedy Central said, have you moved to New York yet? And what I heard in my head was, Comedy Central, the whole network, once made demands that you move to New York City right now. And within a year, I had done that adding to the population of the most crowded, most expensive city in the United States. That question felt like an order. I want you to share your version of that, a question that changed your life. So intro yourself, put your answers in the chat, talk to each other about what you're seeing. That is what today is all about. Questions about questions. It's the very meta special episode of Unfinished Live. And that's not new for us here at this show. Now, for those of you who are here for the first time, and I see you, Alex and Keela, in Nashville. What's up? Shout out to the chat room. Unfinished Live is an interactive digital series where we've used your questions to understand the world around us. We've done this with artists and experts, innovators and people on the street. We've done this across topics like technology and humanity, democracy and voice, economy and justice. And through it all, we have focused on inquiries, not just answers. That's because questions can disarm us. They can connect us to one another and help us stay in a place of curiosity and discovery for at least a little while longer. Questions can change our lives, can change our culture. They can change everything. So sit or stand or walk, but please don't be driving while chatting alongside us this hour as we explore the power of questions with films and with conversations. We've invited artists and culture shapers to help us out here because their work often begins with questions. We're also gonna end today by unveiling two projects that Unfinished is taking on, including an announcement from Bruce Springsteen. That's right, I don't get to say that every day, so let me repeat. We got an announcement from the boss. So trailer alert, teaser alert, make sure you stick around for that. Now, for those who've been here before, you know the drill. We hope you will join in, whether you're in the chat responding to each other or you're weighing in on social media using our bespoke hashtag, Unfinished Live. We thought about that all on our own. Now, up in a moment, we'll meet the world-renowned art critic, historian, and curator of the Serpentine Gallery, Hans Oren Obrist, and Precious Okayoman, a poet, artist, and chef who says everything is one big, great poem. Why pretend otherwise? But first... Let's talk about a question that has taken on new meaning in 2020. Take a look and continue to connect in the chat. Again, as long as you're not driving. It's just a completely unprecedented time. We're all doing this for the first time. Hay mucha tristeza, hay muchas traumas, con mucho miedo y incertidumbre. You never know when somebody might want to be asked, you know, how are you? ¿Cómo estás en mis teco? Es a y pa o. It's our nature to greet people, welcome people, to make the environment around people as warm and welcoming as you can. If you ask someone how they feel, they kind of decide on how deep they want to go. This is a hard week for me. Just trying to like take one day at a time. Things are just lost over and over again. People really tell you how they are. It's not just a cordial thing anymore. It's, it's meaningful now. I pull myself back when I feel too overwhelmed to answer or deal with telling the truth. Everybody's bogged down. I can't do this, I can't do that. 
I think there are more questions that I'm afraid to ask myself, and that's because I don't have answers to them. How long am I going to keep this up? How long are we going to be able to survive? Quizás puedo pasar noches sin dormir pensando en cómo crear cosas positivas. Pero qué puede hacer Natalia, un ser humano insignificante. You have to use what you have. I started painting out here, and there was one gentleman. He said, I just wanted to say, you make me feel good just to see you out here. That made me feel like I was doing something. I feel like my hands are getting better. I'm becoming more skilled, so I feel good about myself, feel accomplished. Realizing that I could come outside and jump around has been incredibly freeing. En pequeñas cosas podemos hacer cambios. Como seres humanos deberíamos de hacer las preguntas quién realmente yo soy, hacia dónde voy, cuáles son mis principios, mis valores. Change can actually happen really rapidly. Approaching this world with a spirit of inquiry can help us feel more at home. Your curiosity is growth. It really allows us to move forward to take the next step out of the despair that everyone's in right now. When I want to do something, I could have a temper tantrum with myself and cry, but I push on. In Oaxaca, hay una palabra que es la guelaguexa, y es de compartir. Es momento de ver las cosas positivas de nosotros mismos y de compartir esto con nuestro mundo. You have to just keep going and imagine that people can be okay, that the world can be okay. Sorry, it devolves. <laughs> <laughs> I'm optimistic. Hopeful. Grateful. Tomorrow isn't promised to you. Just take it as it comes. Hi, everyone. We're on Unfinished Live, and it's a Great, great pleasure and privilege to welcome Precious Okayoman. Uh, Precious, I'm so excited. This is our seventh interview. And I was thinking that maybe today we could begin with the only recurrent question in all my conversation. And that's the conversation, actually the question about the unrealized project. And when I asked you this question before, you told me that you have this wonderful unrealized project about the community that is a sustainable installation of future world building, a queer space of people you love and with whom you live together and work on actually building these worlds. Can you tell us a little bit about this idea of future world building? I feel like the only thing we have left to do is build new worlds with new languages of play and joy and endless symphonies. So that's all I'm obsessed with. I'm like, dreams are free. <laughs> They're all we have left to continue us into the future. And we need, we need each other. We need to be entangled with each other. We're not separated. And we need to really think about how we want to move in the new world. Uh, you also say that there is no singular artist. You say that's impossible. And actually in one of your poems, the Sky Song, you say no to the ego. Can you tell us a little bit about that? There is, there is no independent self that isn't leaking and um, constantly um, fully entangled with other people. You don't make art independently. You don't do anything independently. We all constantly go outside and we are brushed and touched by anything and to pretend that there's a separate eye that just goes on being eye is impossible. We need, maybe that's the most urgent thing in 2020 is to destroy this concept of eye. We are, I mean, if the world today has shown us anything is that we really need each other and it's urgent and there is no I, <laughs> there's only we <laughs> here. But that's really urgent for 20, but also for 21 and for the future. And of course, what is also urgent is love, uh, actually. Can you talk a little bit about love and also what drives you to write poetry? I'm in Arles right now in France and every time I go outside there's this special wind that comes and it blows everything away and it reminds me constantly that the only thing that moves us is love 
And I've been writing these poems that are like songs to the wind. They, at first they started as sky songs and now I'm writing these wind songs. I think everything is just an endless symphony at this point. <laughs> I'm just trying to translate um, how God is moving me, maybe just the earth. Um, it's been nice being here. It's been nice talking to nature again. <laughs> Beautiful. So you've you've been writing poems about the, the famous wind in Aal, which is the Mistral, no? <laughs> the Mistral. It moves me. It moves me terribly here. It moved me to tears the other day. It just blew everything away. Almost blew rainbow away. <laughs> you know, Jonas Mekas did a beautiful film. He actually tried to film the Mistral. Wow, how do you yeah. film the wind? How to film the wind, yeah. <laughs> I wanted to ask you about generosity because it plays a very big role in your work. Generosity also through food, through these amazing dinners you organize. Can you talk a little bit about, yeah, about generosity, but generosity also as a political act? Uh, care is praxis. Honestly, caring for people is like caring for yourself. Food for me is, it has become this way of like, I found it as like healing myself through healing others of like making a huge meal for people and allowing them to feast with love. I remember this time last year, I was getting ready to make a dinner with Ritalfar in Florence. And it was this beautiful, huge, luscious dinner that we called the end of the world. And truly maybe a world did end in the transition portal to this new decade. And it felt that like, the only thing that you really could do with other people was care for them like earnestly and open-heartedly as generously and lovingly as you can. And that might be the only thing that could free us um, from whatever premortal fear and anxiety that holds the matrixial drive together. It's also been part of your time in, in Al was uh, a second a second lockdown. I just wanted to ask you to tell us a little bit um, your reading list of, of poetry, poets you think we should all read in this time. Oh, okay, so Alexis Pauline Gibbs, that's a huge duh. I would start with M Archive because it feels like a prayer that you really need to be aware of right now. Um, second, I think it's Dana Ward's Crisis of Infinite Worlds. It's just one of the most beautiful books of poetry of the 20th century, I think. Um, I love, I mean, just because I'm a sucker, I'm going to say Fred Moten again, because I think um, his Little Edges book is just so romantic. There's something about just sitting there with that book. You could just read it endlessly. Harmony Holiday, love Harmony All Holiday. She just made a, um, a vinyl album. I think enough poets don't get to record audiobooks and musical audiobooks at that. So she just recorded a poetry book that's a song and jazz and her poems. It's just honest, it's I'm such a fan. Um, also Sean Henry Smith's Wild Peach. I just started that and it's been absolutely delightful. Absolutely. It's, um, it feels like I'm sitting in the hot sun and it's lightly burning me, but it's fine. I'm okay with it. <laughs> um, so it's like, that's a rough top five. During the lockdown, I think I've also been thinking a lot about rituals and uh, Andrei Tarkovsky actually said, the filmmaker, that we live in a world which is too bereft of rituals and we need to think about introducing new rituals. So I was kind of wondering if you can tell us a little bit about your, your daily rituals. My daily rituals that keep me, um, that keep me here is that in the morning I, use, I wake up and I do my stretches and then me and Rainbow take a walk and we, we talk, we talk to the wind, <laughs> we talk to the sun, um, we sing. I think it's important every day to go outside and deeply listen to everything around you and be present in that. And that's like one of my things is that I have to go outside no matter what it is in the first hour I wake up, walk around and, and 
literally talk <laughs> to the space around me and just be be with it. I also think it's very important to to meditate. I've been meditating a lot, even if it's like 20 minutes a day. It's really important, I think, for artists and also for everybody to just sit with yourself and listen to what you need because that really helps you remember what your needs are and also remember what your desires are and be more in touch with your dreams. Also, I think it's important to write down your dreams. I started a dream journal for this whole time I've been in Aura. And I remember, and I, this is also like, it's become another unrealized project for me is that I think it's important that everyone be communing about their dreams and talking about them and trying very hard to remember them. And I feel like it would be really nice to have a dream archive. <laughs> so here we have a few questions, unfinished questions from our listeners, from our participants. Uh, and I'm going to read you a few. So Precious, the first question is, what are you the mirror of? Hmm. Well, I'm a mirror of everyone around me. Everything I love is everything I am at the end of the day. <laughs> it's really simple. Mostly rainbow. <laughs> Me and rainbow echo each other. Is and rainbow here? Yeah, look at it. I'm going to bring them over. You're taking it out. This little poodle. This is what I'm a mirror of. Oh, wow. Hi, Rainbow. <laughs> so great. So the second question we received from uh, the participants, from the listeners, uh, are you free? Mm. Well, freedom is constant flight and constantly being aware of the fact that you're flying with everyone you love. And maybe I think it's hard to be completely free, but I feel at peace, which is maybe the next step, freedom. <laughs> next question we received, another unfinished question from one of our listeners. What are you protecting? What am I protecting? Everyone, everything, everyone I love <laughs> and everyone I don't love too, which is nobody because I try really hard to love everyone. <laughs> Great. Next question is, how do you keep your heart open even when it hurts? You have to be really open like the wind. And you have to let things blow through you and move you. And then you're in this constant state of always being open, even if it hurts, so you can be moved and tossed around. And then you're able to breathe a lot deeper, so much deeper. And then you keep loving even deeper. <laughs> That's such a wonderful conclusion. Precious, thank you so, so much for this conversation. <laughs> Thanks to Unfinished. <laughs> this is a rendezvous of question marks. Thanks. My name is Bayete Ross-Smith. I'm an artist and one of the co-creators of Question Bridge. Listening can be a passive form of generosity. However, a more active version is asking a question. In this project, over 2,000 Black males ask each other questions. Here are just a few. All right, my question is, I try to live good, but I'm surrounded by bad. And I want to know what it is I could do to do better and live peaceful, surrounded by all evil. How can, how can I do that? Why didn't y'all leave us the blueprint? How come more of us don't serve? What do you really think about white women? How does it feel to see someone lose their life? What do you dream about? What are you passionate about? What do you live for? If you woke up tomorrow morning and you could be anything you wanted to be, would you still choose to be a black man? My question to the black man in America or anywhere else is, what is common to all of us that we can say makes us who we are? So I have a question for you. Are you threatened by black gay men? Do they scare you? Do they make you afraid? Do they make you uncomfortable? And why is that? This may seem like a silly question, 
but I want to know, am I the only one who has a problem eating chicken, watermelon, and bananas in front of white people? You know, I wonder, black man, are you really ready for freedom? And if not, what will it take for you to want and need this freedom? So here's one black man. Who started this? What is that? Why do black men do that? And I notice we only kind of do that in America when I'm up in Canada working. I don't, I don't really see too many Canadian black men doing. What's that about? Growing up, I've seen very negative depictions of what it means to be black on the television. So my question to somebody that's made it, um, whether you're a black man or a black woman is, how does the representation of black folks affect who you are? Basically my question is for a black man who's been married to a black woman for quite a long time, 25, 35 years or so. I want to know, how do you know that she was the one for you? How do you know that she was gonna be your wife? How do you know that she was someone you could spend the rest of your life with? What is the last word that we can remember you by as a black man? For your last day on this earth, what is the last, what is the word, a word that we can remember you by? I have a question. How do you know when you become a man? That last clip was from a project called Question Bridge, brought to us by Unfinished Partner for Freedoms, where black men of all backgrounds and ages were invited to ask and respond to questions about life in America. I actually took part in this project myself a few years ago, and it's hard to explain how profound it is to literally sit with someone else's question and then to dig deep to offer up your own. Really glad to see that project in this series. Now I want to check in with y'all about the question that changed your life. Uh, but before I do that, there was one other thing that jumped out to me. I'm just remembering from Precious, our poet friend in France, no less. There is no I, only we. Whoa. Okay. That, first of all, I believe that. I also believe that is a very hard sentiment to carry in our individualized Western and especially American context. So that's the question I'm thinking about. Can we really embrace that? Now, in terms of your questions, uh, a bunch of you said, will you marry me? Was the question that changed your life? That's a beautiful question. I hope it changed your life. If it didn't, that's kind of an awkward question. So thank you for sharing that it did. Matthew shared, uh, are you going to the concert this weekend? As a question that changed his life because it came from the girl he had a crush on in high school. Aww. Now, Stephanie, we got like a pairing of questions here. Stephanie said the question that changed her life what if God is dead? Casey said the question that changed Casey's life, will you accept Jesus into your life? I need Stephanie and Casey to get into a room and hash this out. All right. Frederick's most important question changing his life for 2020, would I retire and stay at home and take care of my granddaughter? Stay at home granddad question. Wow. And Megan asks, have you ever been lost forever? as the question that changed Megan's life. Now, I want to acknowledge a couple more folks in the chat real quick. I was scrolling back. I really do show up for real. This is truly live. And I want to acknowledge Sheila Fernandez Garrett. You win for first comment of the night, clocking in 31 minutes before we even started the show. You win that age-old internet contest of first. Um, and then Mahogany Brown, I see you. We are blessed with your presence in the room. Mo Brown's in the house. Check out Mahogany Brown and her work. Now look, lots of these are big questions, but as we've also seen, some of them are very simple, very small questions. Short questions like, how are you? They can make people think or feel or change the way people imagine the world around them. So I've got a challenge to you. I want you to reach out to someone you care about, maybe someone who needs a listening ear or someone to laugh with, and just ask them, how are you? And in the spirit of action and commitment and shared accountability and community, I want you to type the first name of the person you're planning to reach out to with that question. Type that first name in the chat. Don't want the second name, no surnames. We are not trying to do any kind of privacy violating stuff here. See episode three on tech and humanity for further justification of that position. 
And on behalf of the thousands of people we are going to reach out to, thank you. In this next segment, uh, we're gonna share with you pioneers in cultural change. Anna DeVere Smith, award-winning actress and playwright, MacArthur Genius, and National Humanities Medal recipient, plus Alicia Garza, civil rights activist and organizer, principal at Black Futures Lab, and co-creator of Black Lives Matter. We'll end by peering into the inner lives of teenagers from Belair, Ohio. And I've seen some folks from Belair showing up in the chat. Thank you for being with us tonight. We're gonna listen to the questions that these teenagers asked of themselves, accompanied by photographic portraits. I'm gonna warn you, I'm gonna ask you to prepare yourselves to see how deeply you're able to listen, how we can listen when we hear with open hearts these open and honest questions. Well, it has been quite a year between the pandemic and all of the killings uh, that have happened. What have you learned from, from this? I, I know you have definitely learned a lot. So yeah. brief me. I've learned a ton of things, but the first thing I've learned is that we have a lot to do as a country to really understand what racism is and what it isn't. So much of this summer's events get framed as, you know, issues that are isolated incidents. They are things that bad people do um, and they exist in isolation. But in fact, racism is not about good people and bad people. It's about rules and it's about power. And if anything, I've learned that we have a long way to go to really start to unlock the truth of what has been at the foundation of this country and then, right, only then can we actually start to reconcile, adjust, and transform those dynamics so that we can be a different country moving forward. You know, um, I want to thank you. For, I'm sure you've had a chance to, uh, you know, get this book uh, into many frames, but I want to thank you for sending me my own personal copy. And um, uh, I've been on deadlines, so I haven't had a chance to dig in, but I, the first chapter I read was a chapter on identity politics. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things that's interesting to me about that chapter is that so often people think the way to heal our, uh, our poor construction in America, basically, is that we're all one and we're all united and they don't want to recognize differences. And I thought you could say something about that and even give the etymology of identity politics, which is completely misunderstood. It's deeply misunderstood. And I'm so glad that you have that book in your hands and I can't wait to hear what you think about it. I'm glad you read that chapter on identity politics. It's one that's been sitting in my gut. I also gut. read about where you came from too. But. <laughs> yeah. It's been sitting in my gut for a little bit. So I was happy to get it out. You know, identity politics is so misunderstood and it's malaligned. And essentially it's been attacked and it's been attacked because it is an incredibly powerful idea. And it's very, very simple. It's the idea that our experiences <laughs> right, are shaped by our identities. And some of those identities are ones that we take on on our own, but so many of them are categories that have been constructed for us. And the purpose of constructing those identities is all about how power is distributed and how resources are distributed. And so nobody wakes up in the morning and says, I wanna be black today, right? These are categories that we are given, that we are assigned. And those categories have meaning over our lives, even though they are made up. Um, the making up of it, right, is what uh, keeps people actually left out and left behind. There are many categories like those, uh, being a woman, uh, being disabled, being an immigrant. These are all ways to other some people away from power and away from resources. And so, so much of the conversation coming out of 2016 was about how we need to abandon identity politics as if somehow we can just stop seeing what we see and we can stop understanding how what we see has meaning, right? And we'll all just get along and everything's gonna be fine. But the truth of the matter is that's not how things work. And these aren't new ideas. These ideas come out of, you know, historians and, uh, you know, activists like Kimberly Crenshaw, Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw, who coined the term intersectionality to talk about all of the different ways in which power acts upon our lives and we act upon power. But prior to Dr. Crenshaw, you know, it was black lesbian women who advanced this idea of multi multiplicities. And multiplicities are essentially the idea that 
as black communities, right? We are both and all the time. It's never an either or. Race and white supremacy shapes our lives, it shapes our experiences and it shapes our life chances. So I offer in this book that part of what is so important about understanding these concepts, not just theoretically, but how they play out in our lives, how they live in our bodies, is so that we can build the kinds of alliances with one another that last and that have depth. You know, so much of our lives are not like college campus catalogs, right? <laughs> we don't have one person of each identity or category in our lives and that does not equal kumbaya. What equals power is when people who are actually quite different, that come from different experiences, come from different places, can understand how we got here and where we have the potential to go together. And so I'm hoping that this assault on identity politics actually gets transformed into a way where we start to understand that our differences are actually our strength, not just the things that are common about us. Yes, and I think, you know, one of the themes of uh, this particular Unfinished is questions, because questions, of course, are very active um, uh, forces and dynamics that even create change. And I think in your chapter uh, in identity, on identity politics, one of the things you're, you're asking us to question is exactly uh, why we're in categories, why we choose to be in categories, and what power is in relationship to them. How do you think about, what do you leave, what questions are you leaving this year with? And how do you think about questions as an engine for change and transformation? I'm leaving this year with the questions of, where the hell are we going? <laughs> I mean, to be honest, this year was so bizarre in so many ways. And it really was an anything goes. I feel like I, I've had um, an adrenaline diet since March, at least, where every single day there is something new that is happening and, um, and it's shaping us and it's shaping how we think and how we be together. Um, the big questions I have are, what are the stories you are going to tell about this year? I cannot wait to see what it is that you put on stage. I know um, your eye and your vision and your embodiment of the various complexities of who we are is exactly what we need in this moment. So I'm, I'm sitting in uh, anxious, joyful anticipation of what it is that you will reflect back to us about who we are um, and who we can be. And I'm also really sitting in the questions of um, what is going to be the character of our civic participation moving forward? You know, if anything, we learned this year that democracy is not a spectator sport. And I do worry sometimes that after we've pushed this big boulder up a mountain, right, and we've pushed uh, an initial change over the finish line, that I wonder if people will actually turn away and say, okay, back to what I was doing. I did what I had to do, and now I'm going to go back to where I was. Or if people will say, wow, that felt really good. My impact was such that we were able to intervene on the greatest threat to humanity in a generation, and we're just getting started. So I've been thinking a lot about what will it take for people to embody democracy in the same ways that we embody cynicism, in the same ways that we embody um, dismay about corruption in politics, about the lack of connection and responsiveness to everyday people. I'm hoping that the question for 2021 will be, what else can we do? <laughs> what else are we going to win? That's what I'm looking forward to. Yeah, I think this is, uh, you say, what else can we deal with? You know, one of the limitations of, of art is that even though we have the power to convene people, uh, to indict things we don't like, uh, to love things we love and cause others to do, do so too, is that you know, sometimes we put the audience in the position of passive observers, right? Mm -hmm. So one of my least favorite questions is when people come backstage and say, where's the hope? Because <laughs> yeah. as uh, George Wolf, the director, once said about the two of us, he said, baby, people come to my theater to laugh and yours to cry. Well, yes, <laughs> I, mean, I have a sense of the tragic, but when people come, I've learned now that when people come back and they must ask you this question too, is where's the hope? Is there any hope? I'm like, the hope is you. I'd rather you ask me, what can I do, right? And so to what extent are we gonna have an active citizenry going forward in 2020? And especially with the uh, showman gone out of the spotlight, Donald Trump, 
you know, are we going to be active? I think is a very important question. As you say, what are we going to deal with? But are people going to be willing to come forward? That's exactly right. And, you know, I say in the book that we're at a crossroads and that crossroads is what do we need to provide hospice care to that which is dying and the death needs not be intervened upon, right? And what are the things that we need to provide prenatal care for? What are the things that we are trying to bring into the world and what does it mean to nurture it in such a way that when it is born, it is absolutely glorious and healthy and sustained? And that's the question that I sit with every single day, especially after the madness of this year. And I'm really excited to dive into this next decade with people like you. It's so good to be with you, Anna. Thank you for everything you do. It's been two years. I know. It's been too long is what it's been. Too long. <laughs>
a word or many. Um, and this question of what is the nature of our civic character going to look like and how do we embody democracy is certainly a question I've been living with and trying to answer in my own way through projects like this, through my podcast, How to Citizen. It's beautiful to see so many people wrestling with these questions. As we start to approach the new year, and just a premature congratulations for making it to the new year, uh, it's the season of reflection. And my next question for you is, what is the question that would accompany your portrait? Add your thoughts in the chat, do that thing you do. For me, the question would be something like, does he make time for himself? And I'm not gonna answer that for you right now, but you can tell by the tone of my voice, that's a real question for me in my life. And by the way, these questions, they're not meant to be easy. That's kind of the point. We are tapping into the power of inquiry. Now, I suspect that every one of us has been stopped in our tracks by a question, maybe something we heard tonight because of its boldness or the vulnerability it evokes or its beauty or the revelation it opens inside of us, or maybe it just pierces our heart. That's the power of questions. We're about halfway through our program, and the next three films explore the power of questions expressed by very different people. A couple of inquiring nuns, an artist committed to social justice, and a child. Take a look. If someone came to you on the street and just said to you, uh, are you happy, what would you say? Good afternoon, sir. Could we stop you to ask you a question? What's the question? Are you happy? Groovy. <laughs> yeah, because I, I went to communion this morning. Well, right now, I'm not. But... Oh, I think I'd be happier if the war in Vietnam were over. Uh, I am happy in the, in the United States. Why are you asking? I'm happy in my work, in my personal life, not really. I, think, I don't think right now that there's anything else that would make me happier. Well, there are three big things that make a person happy or responsible for happiness. It's the sex, social life, um, what's the other? So, uh, your work. How about you? Are you happy? When I was young, I used to go to my father's shows and I used to stand backstage. And I'll remember one day walking out and just sort of peeking out behind the curtain and seeing the audience and how many people were just looking up at my father with such admiration and joy. He would use his stage not only to educate people when he would speak between songs, but the songs themselves told stories and the origins of struggle. Growing up in my house, it was a constant open door of social justice activism and artists coming in and out, whether it was dinner parties, whether it was poker games, whether it was deep strategy sessions around the civil rights movement. Growing up, I decided that I wanted to also be a performer. Theater is my first love, and then film became my second love. And then, jump cut to many years later, we designed Sankofa.org to institutionalize the capacity of a Harry Belafonte, of a person who uses their art to inform and shine a light. Sankofa is a Ghanaian word depicted through a bird in mid-flight with its head turned backward, beak open, retrieving an egg from mid-air, symbolizing we have to reclaim our past in order to move forward. My billboard, it's about, have you got a sec? Do you have a second? Do you have a second life? Do you have a second child? Do you have a second chance? Yes, I have a second to listen, to hear. People say history repeats itself. Well, I'm tired of that. <laughs> I don't want history to repeat itself anymore. I want history to shift and change and transform. With the growing cultural revolution that we're seeing right now, we can use art to pull from our ancestors and come forward with new and fresh ideas. It is a collaborative effort of the artist and the activist to really push that agenda to a tipping point. 
And I think that we're moving more and more towards that expression every day. En escondidas casi nunca me encuentran, soy siempre el último que al que encuentran y eso, tengo ganas de escondite que casi nadie sabe. Ya estamos aquí un año y dos meses, ah, y tres meses, estamos en una cárcel para familias. Migración le pidió a mi mamá que firmara un papel para separarla de mí. Y ella dijo que no. Ella no iba a firmar nada que fuera para separarla de mí. Tenemos que estar juntos. Cuando tengo miedo me, me, me leo una historia. Otras veces... Me, me canto una canción, eso ya me hace sentir tranquilo. Junto a ti María, como un niño quiero estar, tómame en tus brazos, guíame en mi caminar, quiero que me escuches, me enseñes a rezar. Ser transparente, serme de paz. Mi tía tuvo un, be un bebé, ahora tengo otro, otra prima. La verdad lo extraño bastante. Quiero estar junto con mi papá y mi familia. Los abogados están intentando parar la, la deportación, así nosotros podemos estar con nuestra familia y en Estados Unidos. No queremos volver a pasar Navidad aquí. Mi abuela cuando decía si ya va a ser Navidad, vamos a decorar el árbol y poner los adornos. Yo, yo ayudaba mucho con eso. Los niños tenemos derecho de estar libres y con nuestras familias. ¿Por qué no podemos ser libres? Why can't we be free? Is there any question bigger than that? Could a bigger question come from a smaller person, not just in size, but in stature, in the society as we have currently designed it, but could choose to redesign it? Why can't I be free? This is a question that people around the world have asked for generations, whether they're exploited for their labor or their gender or their position in some imaginary ladder of value. And it's one that we're going to have to keep asking and finding better ways to answer on top of that. I want to get into some of the questions that you posted in the chat to match your portrait. So here are a few that grab my attention. The other gal says, will I ever love again? Oof. Joseph says, how can I help? As the question to accompany the portrait. And Tenley said, what could she have achieved if she hadn't been an addict? Y'all have taken this assignment very seriously. I am overwhelmed and proud of you for digging deep and asking the tough questions. I was thinking like, what did he have for breakfast? That would have been a great question, but y'all are like, nope, we're going in. We're going in with unfinished. 
So over the course of the last three episodes of Unfinished Live, we asked about how we could build a fair economy and ensure justice for all. We've examined how democracy works and how our voices play a part. We've wondered how technology affects our humanity and whether we can build more humane tech. We've added another question. Can we build tech infrastructure that creates and nurtures these trusted connections? AKA, is the exploitation just baked into the code or could we build something better to connect us to our communities, to our society, and to our institutions with trust? Now, I know that's a tall order. It's a lot harder than ordering a burrito or exploiting labor in a ride-sharing service. That's much easier to pull off. But I'm pleased to give you, exclusively for now, you're the first to find out about this project that has emerged from that question. Can we build tech infrastructure to encourage these trusted connections rather than exploiting them? Unfinished Labs is focused on evolving the web to work for people first, to protect our data, to generate much greater value for the people who use it and not just enable us to be used by it. Imagine it like a town square online, but for the common good, not just for the advertising extraction. That sounds good, and it gets better. A few days ago, I sat down with a group from the Unfinished team. Frank McCourt, the founder and CEO of Unfinished, Allison McCauley, also from the Unfinished team, and an author and educator on emerging tech, and Braxton Woodham, multiple technology startup founder and president of Unfinished Labs. Stay tuned for that now, followed by a special message from the boss himself. Because remember, I promised you Bruce Springsteen, and I meant it. But for now, I'm going to introduce myself talking to others. Frank, talk to us about why you've helped launch this project, Unfinished. What does it mean to you? I see the, the American project suffering. Uh, I see people suffering. And, uh, uh, you know, I look at my journey and more importantly, my family's journey here in, in this country. And we've had uh, five generations of being builders and innovators and entrepreneurs, and uh, we've benefited greatly from uh, this country and, and, and all it's offered. I feel there's a responsibility to make it better, just like others did for me. So if you think of this American project as unfinished, you, you kind of get the point of unfinished. But we see a, an economy right now that is uh, completely um, out of whack. You know, there's tremendous uh, inequity uh, and it's not sustainable. Uh, we see a democracy that is um, polarized to the limit, uh, where it's it's uh, it's at the breaking point, I would say. Uh, and we see we see technology, which is uh, you know ironically um, holds the promise to solve all of this, and instead it's exacerbating the problems. And uh, yeah, so this is what I'd finish is about to 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 get a grip on this and to redirect. Uh, reinvent really technology and redirect it so that it can work for people and and make our democracy much more healthy and work for people so that uh, there's a shared economy and you know everybody gets to to benefit from the um, the game changer that technology is. Uh, in our last episode, Frank, we threw out this question: Is tech our undoing? And I'd love to know what's your answer to that question. Yeah, if you step back and think about culture and change, you know, which this episode is about, it's um, nothing has had more impact on our culture than technology. And uh, nothing has been a bigger change agent uh, than technology. So as we talked about it and reflected on it, we, we, we you know, came to the conclusion that we're not going to fix the economy and make it more just and <clears throat> not fix our democracy and make it less polarizing and more inclusive and more constructive without fixing technology. So uh, that's why labs is, Unfinished Labs is, is so important to our effort here. What I'm hearing you say, Frank, it sounds to me like you want technology to work for people and not just have people working for tech um, and sort of shifting how the value flows in the system. Talk to me about Unfinished Labs and the very boldly named Project Liberty. What are these things? 
Project Liberty is a, um, a you know, name we've given to a, to a new protocol, really, that, uh, you know, this thin layer that sits on top of the internet as we know it, and um, uh, really repurposes the internet and redirects the internet uh, in a way that it, it uh, um, you know, protects people. Allison, I'd love to bring you in here to, to flesh out more of what, what does this look like? What's going to be possible if we have more controls over our data, um, fleshing out what this Project Liberty thing is and what it might actually enable? We really need true public and community spaces that really work for people first. And a critical first step of that is to create a, a shared public infrastructure. And, and that's what we're building. It's opening up an opportunity to build spaces that operate in a whole new way where we control our data by default. And we know who else in this square is actually human. And we can all own the power of our own networks. And with new technology that we have available today, we can actually embed these principles into the core layer so that uh, people who are building on top, social innovators or change makers and entrepreneurs can actually build public and community spaces that are designed to serve the people who use them. Uh, Braxton, I'm gonna tap you in now and then we can open this thing up. If I'm watching this, listening to this, I have in my head a model is called Facebook. It's a global town hall. I have this other thing called Twitter. It's a global town hall that's striving to encourage healthy conversation. That's what the CEO of that company talks about a lot now. So what is different about Project Liberty? Is it essentially a public version of a Facebook or a Twitter? And, and how is it enabling something that we don't currently have access to? A global town hall really shouldn't be privately owned. I think that's uh, most people would agree. And putting any one person in charge of, you know, saying they're unbiased, the way you've heard in the news, and you know, an unbiased, um, benevolent kind of dictator of how we all interact, just sh I think should be concerning to most people. So, what we think is different is focusing on one a return to protocols versus platforms for orchestrating the town hall so that it's done as an extension of the internet and the web, as opposed to uh, held within a private, the bounds of a privately held platform. So that's the first part. We thought that the town hall infrastructure should primarily be like, like the way most roads are, public infrastructure um, running on protocols that are governed in a way that is, is you know, fair for, for all. Because your relationships are your relationships. They're not, those are my Facebook friends, those are my Twitter followers, it's, those are my friends. Those are my followers. Wherever I show up, they can see me and I can see them, whether I'm using, you know, app A or app B. So that's, that's really a fundamental difference mm -hmm. um, is, is that kind of shared space that really is truly shared. Yeah. I'd also add to what Braxton said is that this protocol will be, it, it will be open. Our intention is to, is to, is to give the protocol to, to humanity and, uh, uh, it will be open source and available to everyone. When I when I hear the word protocol, I know what that means because I'm a big nerd and my mom was a computer programmer and I had a computer since like 1983 in, in the house. But a lot of people may not know what that means. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to explain this and you tell me if I'm right or wrong. Okay. Email has a standard protocol such that I can be a Gmail user and I can send something known as an email to a Yahoo user or an AOL user and we can both send and receive because it meets a certain standard. Uh, you used roads and we have a certain standard for roads, asphalt, concrete, signage standards. So you know when to slow down, stop what the speed limits are written in a certain language, right? We have protocols to govern how we interact in these spaces. Are you essentially proposing some common infrastructural standard for what a social network is? That's correct. So there we have protocols for the web, the web actually is the hypertext transfer protocol now, you know, and so that that's rules for how websites, you know, work, right? And so we're proposing to extend those rules to, to, to encompass the way that people interact in the digital domain or in digital spaces. Yeah. So, you know, our relationships, there can be a protocol for that, that any application, any platform can use. It should not be proprietary. 
So I want to focus on this innovation. Like you're building this public infrastructure. You're going to gift it. Sounds really nice, really altruistic. Um, yet we live in a world of extraordinary capitalism and financial incentives and investors who seek extraordinary returns. What is the lure here? for the next wave of innovators to build on top of this public infrastructure rather than pursue the winner take all model that's proven so successful for a relatively small group of super rich people? Well, it's a good question. I think that for innovators, it's a much better world. Uh, I've had VCs tell me that as much as 30% of the funding for startups now goes, towards face goes into Facebook to pay for exposure to reach users. So we're proposing to extend the web so that it's a whole different ball game as far as how you can reach users um, and, and people because their, their relationships, once again, are owned by those people. And so it actually should be more open for entrepreneurs uh, than the current world. You see now a lot of entrepreneurs, their end game is just to be bought by one of the big six tech companies where we should really ideally return to a world where entrepreneurs can build companies, applications and companies behind them that flourish on their own. That aren't meant to just be, you know, hoovered up into the, the small group of, a, of basically in a tech oligarchy. In a way, it's about embedding conscience into how technology is developed. Frank, this is all sounding beautiful. I like it. How do I sign up? What do we, how do we John Luke Picard this? How do we make this so? Well, it's, uh, you can check out the, the, unfinishedlabs.io site or the projectliberty.io site for starters. And it, what is key to unfinished is the network we've built of network partners, you know, uh, important um, uh, individuals and institutions that have, uh, that are, that are key stakeholders in our society and care deeply about the future of our society and of this American project. And so having these partners uh, like Georgetown, like Ford Foundation, like Aspen Institute, and I'm sorry, I won't list them all because I don't want to miss anybody, but uh, they're, all, they're all listed on the, on the site. And the list is growing daily. Uh, and we invite everybody in because we need all these voices, not, not the embedded voices of the incumbents. You know, people want solutions. So we're not going to fix democracy or fix the economy unless and until we fix technology. And so this is, and we need, this is a project for all of us to be involved in, which is the whole point of building a, a new protocol, putting it out into the world. Uh, so everybody owns it. It's a public good, a common good. And then let the entrepreneurs like ourselves, quite frankly, you know, we'll build on it. Uh, you'll build on it. Other people will build on it. But now we'll have a fair level playing field. I love that. I'm signing up. If I've, Maybe I'm already signed up. I'm clearly hosting this thing. So I'm signed up, but I'm going to get other people to sign up too, because I, I dig everything you just said, Frank, Braxton, Allison. I hope Project Liberty will be a part of building a platform for a thousand beautiful answers to bloom uh, in, in a healthier version of capitalism on a common invested foundation that we can all participate in. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Barry. Good day. There's something happening in the United States and all around the world. Folks in factories and on shop floors are seeing machines take over their jobs and getting pushed out of the workforce without anywhere else to go. Black men and women are facing violence and discrimination from the people who are supposed to keep them safe. Our politics have become more angry and more vicious with no space for real conversation. The way the world is changing too often benefits people who already have had all the breaks without leaving space for anyone else to grow and succeed. We're finding ourselves isolated and powerless to fight back and we have lost the shared experience of humanity that makes it all worth it. So where do we go from here? What needs to change and what is possible now? Unfinished invites people from all colors, all locations, all walks of life to share not what they already know, 
or have an answer for. But what they're grappling with, the things you're struggling with, unfinished aims to understand the questions you're asking yourself now. No matter who we are, rich or poor, black or white, famous or just getting started, we all deserve to be a part of the conversation that shapes our world. We deserve to have our voices heard. That's what Unfinished is about. Where are we going? Who do we want to be? Who do we want to be? Are we statistics? What does a moral nation do? At what crossroads are you standing? What do you fear most? How do you define courage? What needs to die and what needs to be born? In order to ask the right questions, we need your voice your experience, and your insight to the world around you. What's the question that you believe is the most important? What is the question that keeps you up at night? What's the question that you'd shout from the mountaintop? Go to Unfinished and share your questions with us. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that was, uh, that was Bruce Springsteen. I was just on a show with Bruce Springsteen. What? Yes, this is not about me, but if I made it mildly about me, I'd be like, this is the day that Baratino was in that show with Bruce Springsteen. Uh, the tech panel, the Project Liberty, I want that to be successful. One, the name is amazing. It sounds like something the Avengers or a group of superheroes would be up to, and that's the level of effort we need to restore some semblance of balance and human dignity to this tech economy that we are trapped inside of right now. Two, if they donate this code to the public and people can really build and innovate on top of it, that's kind of why we built the internet in the first place. We, yes, me and you, we did it. The internet's just people. And we didn't build it so that we would all just be digital serfs on the land owned by a handful of folks. So let's get on that. You heard the boss. Go to unfinished.com, share your burning questions with the world. What do you think the most important questions to ask are? In the coming days, Unfinished is going to gather your questions from folks all over the globe, and then we're going to share them with leaders and organizations and politicians. We'll put them online in videos and social media posts. We'll use them to shape content for future episodes of Unfinished Live in the next year. You heard it here first. This is not a big exclusive for you. And we're going to work with other organizations to turn them into content that gets noticed and interventions that lead to change. And in every case, we're going to use them to start interactions that bring people together around our shared needs and help us imagine what's possible if we listen to each other. This is just the beginning. That's what this whole series has been about, asking questions. And it's called unfinished because we're never finished. Even when the work is done, there's more work to do because the work of evolving our democracy, our self-governance, our place in society is an unending journey. And we are privileged to be a part of it. So take pride in the unfinished nature of it. It's not an incomplete assignment. It's a lifelong and post-life journey. Now, I want to offer some tremendous thanks to the Unfinished Network partners who deserve some airtime, who've helped bring this thing to light and to life. Thanks to The Shed, Georgetown University, Policy Link, Ashoka, Imperative 21, Ford Foundation, Four Freedoms, Max Stenbeck Charitable Fund, Meal M2, McCourt, and especially Aspen Ideas. I also want to thank the production crew, safely around me, tested masks, like so responsible. Thank you to the team at Empire. I've been coming to you from an undisclosed location in Los Angeles. I'm going to disclose it. Hot Shop Muffler in Highland Park. Thank you so very much to your crew, to the space, uh, and to the love with which you've allowed us to pull this off. And as we sign off, here's the most important thing to remember. 
Just like 2020, this series may be done for now, but unfinished is just getting started. And if we wanna make real progress, we need to create better relationships, build a more inclusive society, and strengthen the basic trust that keeps us together. That's all it is at the end of the day. It's us, it's trust, it's our belief in each other that makes any of this possible. So let's keep believing in this work that is as always unfinished. Let's keep asking questions, keep connecting, and keep being good to each other. I have been so excited to be your host. Baratunde is my name. Interneting is my game. You can find me wherever you can find Baratundes because that's me. I got all of them. I, I, did, I took care of that in the 90s. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You can't just keep your heart open all the time. You, you do have to check in heart and brain together. Ask questions that are really questions. Like we are so skilled and it's our, our questions are arguments. Bring it down to the scale of you and strangers in the town you live in. If I'm hurting, they're probably hurting too. And is there an opening I can make here uh, for us to rehumanize each other? You heal the soul of the nation by healing the body of the people. If we get the equity agenda right, we get everything right. If we get the racial equity agenda right, we actually have an economy that we can count on into the future. The American dream is unfinished. I am a believer in this dream. I am a believer in the mobility escalator that made my journey possible. The new American dream, I think, is a version of the old one, except everybody is invited. But the truth is that moral courage comes not from standing up to the people with whom you disagree. It comes from standing up to the people with whom you agree on behalf of those with whom you disagree. We can't mistake presence for power. Visibility and awareness and being at the table doesn't substitute the ability to shape or change the rules. And what I hope is possible is that we can heal as a country, begin the healing process, and also uh, find a national sense of purpose, of identity. He's so unfinished, so unfinished.